feel uh, the same way that uh, the world is in transition. Uh, you know, <laughs> there was a, a way that it was before and we're going to something new. It's, I believe it's going to be good. I believe that it's going to be filled with the goodness of God. But um, it's difficult, isn't it, in transition? Transition's always hard. And I just want to say I relate to you wherever you're at um, with the transition that's going on. We've had lots and lots of it. Um, and so today I, w- I want to be able to um, just talk to you about hope, carry on with that whole theme of hope. Um, that we're in at the moment, and I've, I've so much enjoyed what uh, uh, what Jay had to say and what Rod had to say the last couple of weeks, um, and we're going to kind of carry on in the va- that vein, but also kind of take a new uh, kind of angle at that hope, at that issue of hope in our lives. Um, you know, sometimes preaching can be like um, you're standing in the same building, but you're looking out of different windows, right? So uh, today's just a slightly different perspective on hope, um, focusing on some of the stuff that we've already talked about to do with Alpha. And I've kind of labeled this abounding in hope, abounding in hope against all odds in, in some ways. God's hope for the world, God's story of hope, and how do we create hope in our lives, but also in people around us? You know, talking about my kids, my, my older kids are at the stage, David, Sarah, and even Noah to some degree, um, where they're starting to ask questions, right? My, my daughter, we were driving my son Noah home from soccer practice the other night, and my daughter said, Dad, why, why in Genesis does it say God created the heavens, plural? Why not just the heaven? And I was like, oh... <laughs> And we spent the whole next half an hour car journey talking about multiple heavens and add to it to my daughter, who's, uh, you know, preteen. And so, um, you know, God, often I pray that God would give me creative answers in those situations. I'm like, God, please help me with this. Now I have to explain that there's possibly three heavens or more than three heavens and that Paul talks about, you know, the third being caught up into the third heaven and Sarah's kind of like, wow, in this car journey on the, on the way home. And um, I was reminded of that in uh, preparing for this and an experience that I had um, just talking to a university student um, that I had met very, very randomly, but um, I'd met him and he was a philosophy student. And um, he kind of, we talked for about half an hour and he was studying something called string theory. And string theory, not to get too technical about it, and not like I'm an expert in it either, um, but string theory is all about different dimensions that may exist in our universe and how one dimension impacts another. And so we were talking about this, and I was like, I'm feeling way over my head right now. Um, He's a university student studying this in depth. And he said, but one thing that frustrates me about God is why does God care about what I put in my body? Like how much I drink or what drugs I take or, you know, who I have relations with or, you know, where I go with my life or what I do with it. Why does he care about all that stuff? And honestly, ping, a light went on in my mind And I wish it would do this with my kids. Um, And it was like, well, it's string theory. It's like string theory. You do those things. God cares about you doing those things because what you do in this world has an impact in a completely other dimension. And that dimension then has an impact on this world. Well, his draw dropped and my draw dropped because I was like, that was really good. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and I was like, gosh, God, I need it right now the other night with my, my daughter in the car. I need some revelation like that. But my point is this, is that we are called to bring hope to the world, but sometimes we feel really inadequate in doing so. But there's this scripture that I'm going to read to you in a moment that says we should abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And some of the challenges that we face in overcoming, reaching out to other people, being hope to others, and also just having hope in our lives, I believe the Holy Spirit wants to come in and help us to not just have a little bit of hope, but overflow in hope. And that's what God was doing, and he kind of bypassed my intellect and gave me his intellect in that situation. And so let me read that scripture to you that I was talking about. It's Romans 15, 12, and 13. Romans 15, 12, and 13. And again, Isaiah says, The root of Jesse will come, even he who arises to rule the Gentiles. 
In him will the Gentiles hope. And verse 13 says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. And the NIV says, uh, so you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. God is giving us something so that we can give to others. And there's a glorious, wonderful story called the gospel that is described time and time again as the gospel of hope. And I believe some of what was shared about the vision of getting behind Jesus was about recognizing that story of what he has done and who he is to us in our lives as a shield against all of the discouragement that might want to come against us. And you see, that's what's happening right now is there's a big story of hope that God has cast over our lives. A story that says he died for you. He took away your sins. And he, he came and rose again so that you can have life and life in abundance. And that story over our lives is being challenged. It's being challenged by all of these other stories that come by our lives. If you think about, you know, what's happening in the world, the most sensational story wins right now. It's not about whether it's a true story anymore. It's not about whether it's... Um, it's even like an, a good, morally good story anymore. It's actually about what is the most sensational story. And I tell you, we have the most sensational story in the world, in the history of mankind, ever. If you look at it just at, purely at its contents, even from a, a somewhat logical perspective, somebody coming to die for everybody else is absolutely transformational. And we have that story that we, we say, God, we want to not just be in allegiance to it, but we want it to become part of our lives, that gospel of hope. And we want to embody it. And so how are we receiving God's hope and then living it out to the other people around us? The question comes down to, as Christians, what story are we buying into? You know, that whole idea uh, of, you know, pause Netflix, try Alpha. You know, I like, I like watching, a, you know, I, I have watched a couple of episodes of different things recently. I, I like watching Netflix, but are we buying into a story on TV more than we're buying into the story of hope? Are we buying into a story of um, uh, political systems or, or um, are we economics more than we are buying into the story of hope? Because even where I work, I need to buy into my, the story of hope first and foremost so that I can give hope and be hope to the people around me. And I want to do that. And so these stories are, are coming at us from all of these directions and we're being challenged to stay true to that one story that we've been given. I don't know whether you feel this way, but I feel this way. And there's one people group that have, throughout history, been true to their story and have done amazing things as a result. And that people group is the Jewish people. In fact, a lot of historians have said there's absolutely no reason for the Jewish people to exist today, logically. They have been through so much. They have been through so many challenges. They have been through so much persecution. There's no reason why they should be here in the place that they are today. One rabbi put it like this. There is a miracle even greater than Moses parting the Red Sea. And that is the miracle of the survival of the Jewish people throughout the ages. It's interesting that he said that even before World War II. Even before World War II, that was what one rabbi said. One of the reasons that several Christians and Jewish people believe that the Jews have continued to be a people of hope in the face of grim circumstances and possible extinction is that wherever they went, they became what's called a creative minority. 
And what that is, is a group of people, smaller than the larger group, fewer in number than the rest of the population, that survives against all odds, but even becomes influential in shaping and molding the world around them, regardless of their numbers. It doesn't matter whether we're big or small. It doesn't matter how much um, we physically have a presence. It matters that we are partnering with God. It matters that we're doing this with him. A creative minority is a group that is influential beyond the logical appearance of the group. It is in this group and this creative minority that the world is given hope in which it lives because this group follows a different set of rules and is loyal to a different story. Jesus was a creative man. Prophesied, there is also actions that God wants us to take as a result of those prophecies that will bring a creative hope to the world. If you're in your workplace today and you're the only believer there, I want to encourage you that God wants you to be a creative minority. Just you plus God means you can change the world. Do you know that? Sure, absolutely. God has used, usually kind of uses two people. That's what he's done traditionally. But you and Jesus is two people. Okay, and you're, if you're alone today and you're discouraged about your context, whether it's in a manufacturing occupation, whether it's in web design, whether it's in the hospital, or whether it's in um, you know, a place where you feel like you're the only one, God wants to be there with you. And he wants to give you creative ways, whether it starts at just fixing the photocopier to whether it goes to inviting somebody for lunch and inviting them to Alpha or whatever it might be. He wants to do it, no matter how small or big. And I encourage you to start in small ways, praying for people, starting to look outward, starting to be prepared to give hope. Because how can we keep this to ourselves? We must be like Jesus as a creative minority. He came to take away the sin, yes. But more than that is he came to give life. We shouldn't be defined about what we just take from the world, what we just say no to. But rather, what are we willing to give into the world so that they can have hope? If something that... um, I've learned working in government is that we can't argue our cases just by saying what should not be or what can't be or were, you know, we can't go or what we can't do. We need to say, what are we bringing in the place of that? Imagine somebody lost at sea saying, this is, this is my, this is what I'm hanging on to. This is what I'm, this is what I'm, I'm, I'm putting my trust in. And, you, and somebody coming along to them and saying, we're going to take that away from you. <laughs> and we're not going to give you anything. <laughs> and so when we anchor to something, like Jay was saying, we're anchoring ourselves to it. But we're also anchoring ourselves to it so we can give it to other people. And say, you get anchored to this as well because it will change your life. And not saying, just give up that or give up this. No, take a hold of this and then let go of that. Take a hold of this. Take a hold of Jesus and let go of the other things. The disciples, 12. With 12 disciples, God built his church. A creative minority. You just think about the Jewish people throughout history and brought hope to society through inventions, art, education, medicine. They are still doing that today, both in Israel and around the world. The irony of it, of course, is that they were, they were suspect in it, that they were thought to be controlling everything behind the scenes. Of course, that wasn't true. <laughs> but you've only got to look at Einstein's life alone to see what the Jewish people have had impact on our world. It is a disproportionate amount to their lives and numbers. And I would like to say to you today that no matter how you see the situation that we're in, God wants us to be more than conquerors to a disproportionate amount compared to our numbers.
the church. Wonderful stories of creative minorities. Just think about Zimbabwe. I don't know whether you've heard of what's been going on over the decades in Zimbabwe, but I had a couple of trips to Zimbabwe a few years ago. Right, funnily enough, right when they exchanged power from one leader to another, which was a little bit scurry. But in that, I found on the ground is that we're looking at the church has become 40% of the population in Zimbabwe, and they have grown under dictation, a dictator's rule. They are now a majority Christian country. And I can tell you, and if you've ever been to Africa, you will know they are, most of them are charismatic, spirit-filled, jumping around, dancing, praying in tongues, on fire for God type of people. And they are having an impact in their prayer and their work in the whole country. In other words, under oppression, they grew. Under oppression, they grew. You think about... Um, Stories like the Clapham sect in London, which was the, the, the group of men that William Wilberforce was part of. And just, just about 12 men, same as the disciples, ended up um, bringing about the abolition of the slave trade. But not only that, they also raised up the Bible Society, which sent Bibles around the world, which is still working today. They put in place the first rehabilitation process for prisoners in England. And they, about 100 other organizations and charities were started from 12 guys sitting around a table praying and asking God what to do and how to impact the world. You think about the Moravian Church and Count Zinzendorf and what he did when they prayed together for a hundred years, families upon families upon families all had their slots of time. And they prayed for a hundred years until a missionary movement was sent out throughout the world that impacted the whole world. They were so on fire for God, it was said that they would sell themselves into slavery so that they could reach the slaves. It just so happens that the Moravians met a guy named John Wesley on a boat going from America to Europe. And on that boat, in the face of a storm, the Moravian missionaries were so grounded in the, the faith and the hope in Jesus that they didn't even flinch in the face of the storm. And John Wesley was so convicted of that experience when he felt so scared of that situation that he went back to England and he had his Holy Spirit experience with God and then he rode the country and hundreds of thousands of people were saved. You don't know what kind of impact you're going to have and what kind of hope you're going to give to people. It might just be that we are supposed to give the world hope by just focusing on Jesus and his word and staying true in the storm in this time. That that alone will be a testimony to the world around us. God loves to work with small groups of people. Being a creative minority means we are constantly looking for ways to bring hope to the world. We may feel pushed down, discouraged by the world, but that is where we must choose to be positive. Hope is a positive outlook on life. How are we having hope in this time? Not to be naive or ignorant or immature about the real issues in the world, but to be positive. I was thinking today, just as we were praying um, at the beginning, I was thinking about joy and all of the times that God's poured out joy. And I was thinking about how, you know, if there's anything more positive that you can have an outlook on, um, or something that gives you that positive outlook, it's joy. And I was thinking about all of the times where, you know, um, I've been in Africa and uh, somebody gets up at the front and they just say, okay, everybody smile, everybody be happy. <laughs> And of course, everybody's just instantly happy and it's just encourage you and, and lifts you up and the smiles in the audience or the laughter and then the times when the Holy Spirit is poured out where you just end up laughing for hours. We need some of that joy. That's abounding in hope. If we're going to have a positive outlook, we need God's joy. We need God's laughter. Okay, and I can see some of you smiling. <laughs> But I just pray for God's joy for you. I pray that it would be poured out upon you. 
I pray that it would be your hope that he would restore the joy of your salvation. That you'd laugh again. Not just at jokes on TV, even though that's good and, and we like that. But you'd have times where you smile and you grin in prayer. That you have times when people walk in and it's just like, why are you laughing? What's the big joke? And you put your hand on their shoulder and then they start falling down laughing as well. Right? You've been there. Lord, more of your joy. Lord, we need it. And so we have these reactions to the world which I think indicate an impact uh, that the world is having on us. We accommodate secu secularization or we basically assimilate it. We bring it into our lives and, and everything about the world becomes part of us. This is called the normalization of the individual. We become just like everybody else. If we do that, what is different about the hope that we're giving? Or we resist the world violently, uh, like the religious extremists. Simon Peter, when um, the servants come the, to take away Jesus, takes his sword out and cuts off the ear of the high priest's servant who's arresting Jesus. But Jesus turns around and takes up the ear and heals him because he's coming at this, that, this whole situation from a different perspective. He's creating something. He's creating a story of hope for that servant's life that even though that servant had to arrest him and take him away something had happened in him regardless of the pressure of the circumstances or we withdraw into our little encl enclaves we react to the world and we withdraw and this of course is okay for a time but then eventually there'll be no amp impact out there and so the fourth option is this, this option of being a creative minority that we've been talking about. This is not easy because it involves maintaining strong links with the outside world while staying true to our faith. Not just to keep the sacred flame burning, but also to create a story of hope in the larger society. And so... Where is it that the story in your life of Jesus is being challenged? I know it is for me. One of the ways that God spoke to me um, many years ago um, was about Christmas and uh, about what we believe about Christmas. And, you know, I don't, I don't mind. We, you know, we have a tree up. We, we do, um, you know, decorations. We give gifts. We give all of that. I'm not saying we should change Christmas, but God convicted me uh, uh, several years ago about what is our perspective of Christmas. That there is a world story of Christmas and there is a God story of Christmas. And the world story says consume, consume, consume. Money, money, money. Pressure, pressure, pressure. I mean, like for some people, Christmas is the most stressful time of the year. Hands up. <laughs> right? <laughs> Why is that? You know, for me, it gets stressful as well. For Andrea, yes, we, you know, we have this idea that it's all about what we give and what we buy. And I'm not saying we shouldn't do those things, but what I am saying is there's a different story for Christmas for us. And God told me a while ago that Christmas is about, one, historically, it's about St. Nick. And if you know about St. Nick, he was a guy that used to break into homes, not to take stuff, but to deposit um, money in people's houses so that they could have what they needed. That's the story of St. Nick. So you think about Father Christmas and you think, actually, what we should be doing at Christmas time is giving hope to people everywhere we go, over and over and over again. And if you think about it biblically, well, we just see this scene of worship when Jesus comes the first thing that happens is he is worshipped. And he came to bring hope. That's what he came. He came to bring hope for the world. And so um, a couple of years back, God challenged us to, um, to think about taking a family missionary trip over Christmas. And I didn't have anything planned. And um, out of the blue, a friend of mine in North Africa came and, and, um, and sent, sent us an email and said, look, my 
my mother and father are sick. They may not last that much longer. Please, could you come over Christmas time and take care of this? It was a church and missions center. And it was his fairly last minute, just a few uh, weeks before we had to leave. And uh, we prayed about it, and we said, basically, this is an answer to what we've been praying about. And so we gave our Christmas up to go to North Africa and serve hundreds of refugees and migrants in North Africa. We still did Christmas. We just put a tree up at home, and we gave presents a few days before we left for the trip. And then we took the kids with us. It was just us. We didn't have time to organize a team or anything else. And David, Sarah, and Noah... And um, Andrea and I took a flight down to North Africa. And every day for two weeks over the Christmas time, we would go down to the beach where all the refugees and the migrants would, would uh, walk by and we would give out tea, we'd give out some food, and uh, when we had it, we'd give out clothing. And it was just us, just our family, giving out stuff. Easy for the kids to do. They loved it. They absolutely loved it. And then we said to them, if you want to come uh, to have a Christmas service at the church on Christmas Day, we want to invite all of you. And I had, we were driving around the church uh, kind of van, which was about 15 pe- people you could fit in there. They said, if you want to come, I know it's a long way up to the church because it was on the side of a mountain. I said, I'll pick you up here on Christmas Day about 9 o'clock. I was thinking maybe you know, 10, 15 people. I showed up on Christmas Day morning, and there was about 100 migrants all standing around this tree. And I spent the whole morning driving this very rickety van up and down this hill. And I just got them all finished right when we were about to... um, to start the service, you know, you know, the, like <laughs> you know the situation, right? You've got everything else to do, and then you've got a service or something to do, right? And so I walk into the service, like, okay, thanks. The whole place is packed. Thanks for coming, everybody. And um, and the the bursting at the seams, and so we spend on Christmas Day, our family spend giving this service, um, and this meeting, this gathering to all these migrants and, and uh, refugees. Some of them told us stories that they had left their home country when they were 10 years old, and now they were 16. And, and they'd been traveling. They had such, you know, such challenges, but then such hope for the future. And uh, the kids did, like, some songs. And um, Andrea and I led some worship, and then we had some prayers, and then we had the, the message. And, of course, like... I was standing there, I had this completely different message, like, ready. And then I just realized, I can't let this moment pass. I have to tell them about Jesus. I can't do anything else. And the whole, like, in that moment, just everything I was saying just changed. And I just started talking about the Christmas story and why Jesus came and why he wants to give them hope and how he wants to give them hope and how they can come to follow him. And at the end probably about 35 to 40 of those migrants came down to the front to receive Jesus. And my kids all had a part in that. And David stood with me as I prayed for the Holy Spirit to come on them after they gave their lives to Jesus. And that whole day, pretty much all of those refugees, whether they were the ones that came and gave their lives to Jesus or whether they were the ones who just stayed just to be around us, they all had an experience of compassion and hope They stayed, we watched the Jesus movie together. That day, we gave them food. We had little presents to give them gifts. Um, We gave some of them Bibles. We counseled some of them. Some of them came back the following days. And we just continue, my family continue to say, you know, remember when. Remember when we did the the different kind of Christmas. And so I want to encourage you that When you buy into the story of the gospel of hope, it's not going to be boring. And it's not going to be discouraging. I know there was times in that trip when, yes, there was things that could have gone wrong, and sometimes they did go wrong. But overall, it was so much worth it to instill in my family this story of hope that Christmas is really about. And so I want to encourage you, Yes, you may not get 
late to North Africa at Christmas, this Christmas. Let's face it, right? But I want to encourage you to, um, to buy into the real story of Christmas. And notice I'm saying buy into. <laughs> buy into the real story of Christmas. Yes, carry on doing what you do. But as well, make room for what Jesus wants to do. That could be just inviting somebody to Alpha. You're unplugging Alpha a lot, you can tell. Okay, but it could be something so much more than just sitting around and eating food with family, even though that is a wonderful thing and quite biblical, right? That's what I mean is that our story is being challenged. But within the story that's being challenged that, that, that we should adhere to and we should build our lives upon, that is where we get our hope. And so I want to just bring some practical ways then of how, how the Jews in Babylon found ways to grow in the midst of captivity. And we know how they, fe- they felt in Babylon because um, it says in Psalm 137 how they felt. It says, by the rivers of Babylon, we sat and wept. And when we, re- when we remembered Zion, how can we sing the songs of the Lord in a foreign land? You could put in, you know, um, in my own house by myself, I sat and wept when I remembered when we used to go to church. How can, we, how can I sing the songs that we used to sing? Yeah? We could, we could you know, this, this describes a lot of what we're going through right now. When Jeremiah was saying some of this, he was actually, he was actually describing um, ways that we can overcome. So Jeremiah 29, 5 to 7 He says, this is the weeping prophet, by the way, guy that's not normally positive. He says, build houses, settle down, plant gardens, and eat what they produce. Okay, what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number. Do not decrease. Also, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which you ha- I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. If it prospers, you too will prosper. And what Jeremiah was saying was that it is possible to survive in exile with your identity intact, your appetite for life undiminished, while contributing to the wider society and praying to God on its behalf. You can have, as a creative minority, you can be a supernatural minority, bringing supernatural hope to the world. He wants you to abound in hope, overflow. And I'm coming in to the last kind of section of this now. And so I encourage you to pray, to get behind the cleanse, to get involved with it, because God's doing something. I encourage you to get involved with Alpha, because God's doing something. And also, if you have things that you know you are being called to do, do that. But do something in this time, whether it's picking up the phone, whether it's reaching out and multiply God's hope in the world. On um, last, last week, I was able to come and be a part of the prayer time. And I had a picture. And I think this describes kind of what I think God wants to do in this time as he encourages us and he builds us up and he says, you can still grow regardless of what the circumstances say. You can still increase regardless of what's happening uh, because I've done it before and I'm going to do it again. Um, and, and it was a picture of a bowl in heaven. I had a picture of a bowl, and that bowl was being filled up with the tears of the saints. And I said to God, what are the tears of the saints? What tears are these? And he said to me, these are the tears that they have shed about not being able to fellowship, about not being able to meet as they have done in the past, about not being able to see loved ones, about not being able to do what, how they've done things in the past. They've shed tears to me, and I'm going to pour out my spirit upon them as a result of it. And I saw those tears being shed by the saints in prayer for God to pour out his spirit because they needed his comfort. And I saw the bowl tip. And God pour out some 
and then it went back and then they carried on praying and it filled up and then it tipped again and it poured out again. And then there was a great tipping point when the whole bowl was poured out upon us. God wants to pour out his spirit to bring you comfort, to bring you into a place of overflow in hope. And so I want to just remind you of that scripture, Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with joy and peace in believing so that the power of the Holy Spirit may abound in you may overflow in you. So can we just stand up? Can we just stand up? It's interesting that um, when the Jews were in Babylon, you know, all of these things happened. You know, Daniel had impact in uh, the king's courts. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you know, were saved out of the flames, the fire. That all came out of that time. Jeremiah says, that's where the famous verse where Jeremiah, uh, Jeremiah says, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. And it ends with the word hope, if you read it. But also, in the Jewish history, the Talmud was written in Babylon. Did you know that? And the Talmud is the spiritual writings, the interpretation of the law. And so the Jews grew in their spirituality under captivity. And so put, put your hands on your heart. In John 7, 37, it says, Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And I just pray for everybody in this room, everybody at home, everybody who's going through difficulties, where the hope has been diluted. I just pray for your encouragement now, Lord. Pray for your infilling, your healing, your love. For those at home, that they would feel connected. Part of this. And I just pray where, where there's any block, blockages, Lord, that you would now release your river to flow from them, God deep inside of them. Psalm 42, verse 7, deep cries out to deep. Just restore and heal. And in your time and in your way, God, bring them opportunities to abound in hope to the others around them. In your name, Jesus. Amen.